he reflected that there was nothing to show that the secret of the treasure had been discovered. The top had been shot off the scorpion fish tank under which Bond had dived, and when the other men came in the morning they would not be surprised to find the fish dead in the tank. They would get the remains of the robber out of the shark tank and report to Mr. Big that he'd been were stay in a gun battle and that there were X thousand dollars worth of damage which would have to be repaired before the secature could bring over its next cargo. They would find some of Bond's bullets and soon guess that it was his work. Bond grimly shut his mind to the horror beneath the floor of the warehouse. He turned off the lights and let himself out by the main entrance. A small payment had been made on account of solitaire and lighter. Live and let die. Chapter 16. The. Jamaica. Version. It was. 2 o'clock. In the morning. Bond eased his car away from the seawall and moyed off through the town on to Fourth Street. The highway to Tampa. He dawdled along down the four-lane concrete highway through the endless gauntlet of motels, trailer camps and roadside emporias selling beach furniture, seashells and concrete gnomes. He stopped at the Gulf Winds Bar and Snacks and ordered a double old granddad on the rocks. While the barman poured it he went into the washroom and cleaned himself up. The bandages on his left hand were covered with dirt and the hand throbbed painfully. The splint had broken on the robber's stomach. There was nothing Bond could do about it. His eyes were red with strain and lack of sleep. He went back to the bar, drank down the bourbon and ordered another one. The barman looked like a college kid spending his holidays the hard way. He wanted to talk but there was no talk left in Bond. Bond sat and looked into his glass and thought about Lighter and the robber and heard the sickening grunt of the feeding shark. He paid and went out and on again over the Gandhi Bridge. And the air of the bay was cool on his face. At the end of the bridge he turned left towards the airport and stopped at the first motel that looked awake. The middle-aged couple that owned the place were listening to late rumba music from Cuba. With a bottle of rye between them. Bond told a story of a blowout on his way from Sarasota to Silver Springs. They weren't interested. They were just glad to take his ten dollars. He drove his car up to the door of room five and the man unlocked the door and turned on the light. There was a double bed and a shower and a chest of drawers and two chairs. The motif was white and blue. It looked clean and Bond put his bag down thankfully and said good night. He stripped and threw his clothes unfolded onto a chair. Then he took a quick shower, cleaned his teeth and gargled with a sharp mouthwash and climbed into bed. He plunged at once into a calm untroubled sleep. It was the first night since he had arrived in America. That did not threaten a fresh battle with his stars on the morrow. He awoke at midday and walked down the road to a cafeteria where the short order cook fixed him a delicious three-decker western sandwich and coffee. Then he came back to his room and wrote a detailed report to the FBI at Tampa. He omitted all reference to the gold in the poison tanks for fear that the big man would close down his operations in Jamaica. The nature of these had still to be discovered. Bond knew that the damage he had done to the machine in America had no bearing on the heart of his assignment, the discovery of the source of the gold its seizure, and the destruction, if possible, of Mr. Big himself. He drove to the airport and caught the silver, four-engine plane with a few minutes to spare. He left Lighter's car in the parking space as in his report he had told the FBI he would. He guessed that he need not have mentioned it to the FBI when he saw a man in an unnecessary raincoat hanging round the souvenir shop, buying nothing. Raincoats seemed almost the badge of office of the FBI. Bond was certain they wanted to see he caught the plane. They would be glad to see the last of him. Wherever he had gone in. America. He had left dead bodies. Before he boarded the plane he called the hospital in. St. Petersburg. He wished he hadn't. Lighter was still unconscious and there was no news. Yes, they would cable him when they had something definite. It was five in the evening when they circled over. Tampa. Bay and headed east. The sun was low on the horizon. A big jet from Pensacola swept by, well to port, leaving four trails of vapor that hung almost motionless in the still air. Soon it would complete its training circuit and go into land, back to the Gulf Coast. 
packed with oldsters in Truman shirts. Bond was glad to be on his way to the soft green flanks of Jamaica, and to be leaving behind the great hard continent of El Dolorado. The plane swept on across the waste of Florida, across the acres of jungle and swamp without sign of human habitation, its wing lights blinking green and red in the gathering dark. Soon they were over. Miami, and the monster chump traps of the eastern seaboard, their arteries ablaze with neon. Away to port, State Highway No. 1 disappeared up the coast in a golden ribbon of motels, gas stations and fruit juice stands, up through Palm Beach, and Daytona to Jacksonville. 300 miles away, Bond thought of the breakfast he had had at Jacksonville. Not three days before and of all that had happened since. Soon, after a short stop at Nassau, he would be flying over Cuba. Perhaps over the hideout where Mr. Big had put her away. She would hear the noise of the plane and perhaps her instincts would make her look up towards the sky and feel that for a moment he was nearby. Bond wondered if they would ever meet again and finish what they had begun. But that would have to come later, when his work was over, the prize at the end of the dangerous road that had started three weeks before in the fog of London. After a cocktail and an early dinner they came into Nassau and spent half an hour on the richest island in the world, the sandy patch where a thousand million pounds of frightened sterling lies buried beneath the canasta tables and where bungalows surrounded by a thin scurf of screw pine and casuarina change hands at fifty thousand pounds apiece. They left the platinum whistle stop behind and were soon crossing the twinkling mother of pearl lights of Havana. So different in their pastel modesty from the harsh primary colors of American cities at night. They were flying at 15,000 feet when, just after crossing Cuba, they ran into one of those violent tropical storms that suddenly turn aircraft from comfortable drawing rooms into bucketing death traps. The great plane staggered and plunged, its screws now roaring in vacuum and now biting harshly into walls of solid air. The thin tube shuddered and swung. Crockery crashed in the pantry and huge rain hammered on the perspex windows. Bond gripped the arms of his chair so that his left hand hurt and cursed softly to himself. He looked at the racks of magazines and thought, they won't help much when the steel tires at 15,000 feet, nor will the eau de cologne in the washroom, nor the personalized meals, the free razor, the orchid for your lady, now trembling in the ice box. Least of all the safety belts and the life jackets with the whistle that the steward demonstrates will really blow, nor the cute little rescue lamp that glows red. No, when the stresses are too great for the tired metal, when the ground mechanic who checks the de-icing equipment is crossed in love and skimps his job, way back in London, Idlewild, Gander, Montreal, when those are many things happen, then the little warm room with propellers in front falls straight down out of the sky into the sea or onto the land, heavier than air, fallible, vain. And the forty little heavier than air people, fallible within the plane's fallibility, vain within its larger vanity, fall down with it and make little holes in the land or little splashes in the sea. Which is anyway their destiny, so why worry? You are linked to the ground mechanic's careless fingers in NASA. Just as you are linked to the weak head of the little man in the family saloon who mistakes the red light for the green and meets you head on, for the first and last time, as you are motoring quietly home from some private sin. There's nothing to do about it. You start to die the moment you are born. The whole of life is cutting through the pack with death. So take it easy. Light a cigarette and be grateful you are still alive as you suck the smoke deep into your lungs. Your stars have already let you come quite a long way since you left your mother's womb and whimpered at the cold air of the world. Perhaps they'll even let you get to Jamaica. Tonight. Can't you hear those cheerful voices in the control tower that have said quietly all day long, come in BOAC. Come in Pan Am. Come in KLM. Can't you hear them calling you down too, come in Transcarib. Come in Transcarib. Don't lose faith in your stars. Remember that hot stitch of time when you faced death from the robber's gun last night. You're still alive, aren't you? There, we're out of it already. It was just to remind you that being quick with a gun doesn't mean you're really tough. Just don't forget it. This happy landing at Palisados Airport comes to you by courtesy of your stars. Better thank them. Bond unfastened his seat belt and wiped the sweat off his face. To hell with it, he thought, 
as he stepped down out of the huge strong plane. Strangways, the chief secret service agent for the Caribbean, was at the airport to meet him and he was quickly through the customs and immigration and finance. Control. It was nearly eleven and the night was quiet and hot. There was the shrill sound of crickets from the dildo cactus on both sides of the airport road and Bond gratefully drank in the sounds and smells of the tropics as the military pickup cut across the corner of Kingston and took them up towards the gleaming, moonlit foothills of the Blue Mountains. They talked in monosyllables until they were settled on the comfortable veranda of Strangways' neat white house on the Junction Road, below Stony Hill. Strangways poured a strong whiskey and soda for both of them and then gave a concise account of the whole of the Jamaica end of the case. He was a lean, humorous man of about 35, a former lieutenant commander in the special branch of the RNVR. He had a black patch over one eye and the sort of aquiline good looks that are associated with the bridges of destroyers. But his face was heavily lined under its tan and bond sensed from his quick gestures and clipped sentences that he was nervous and highly strung. He was certainly efficient and he had a sense of humor, and he showed no signs of jealousy at someone from headquarters butting in on his territory. Bond felt that they would get on well together and he looked forward to the partnership. This was the story that Strangways had to tell. It had always been rumored that there was treasure on the Isle of Surprise and everything that was known about Bloody Morgan supported the rumor. The tiny island lay in the exact center of Shark Bay a small harbor that lies at the end of the junction road that runs across the thin waste of Jamaica from Kingston to the north coast. The great buccaneer had made Shark Bay his headquarters. He liked to have the whole width of the island between himself and the governor at Port Royal so that he could slip in and out of Jamaican waters in complete secrecy. The governor also liked the arrangement. The Crown wished a blind eye to be turned on Morgan's piracy until the Spaniards had been cleared out of the Caribbean. When this was accomplished, Morgan was rewarded with a knighthood and the governorship of Jamaica. Till then, his actions had to be disavowed to avoid a European war with Spain. So, for the long period before the poacher turned gamekeeper, Morgan used Shark Bay as his sally port. He built three houses on the neighboring estate, christened Yonrumney after his birthplace in Wales. These houses were called Morgans, the Doctors, and the Ladies. Buckles and coins are still turned up in the ruins of them. His ships always anchored in Shark Bay, and he careened them in the lee of the Isle of Surprise, a precipitous lump of coral and limestone that surges straight up out of the center of the bay and is surmounted by a jungly plateau of about an acre. When, in 1683, he left Jamaica. For the last time, it was under open arrest to be tried by his peers for flouting the crown. His treasure was left behind somewhere in Jamaica. And he died in penury without revealing its whereabouts. It must have been a vast hoard, the fruits of countless raids on Hispaniola, of the capture of innumerable treasure ships sailing for the plate, of the sacking of Panama, and the looting of Maracaibo. But it vanished without trace. It was always thought that the secret lay somewhere on the Isle of Surprise, but for two hundred years the diving and digging of treasure hunters yielded nothing. Then, said Strangways, just six months before, two things had happened within a few weeks. A young fisherman disappeared from the village of Shark Bay, and had not been heard of since, and an anonymous New York syndicate purchased the island for a thousand pounds from the present owner of the Yonrumney estate, which was now a rich banana and cattle property. A few weeks after the sale, the yacht secature put into Shark Bay, and dropped anchor in Morgan's old anchorage in the lee of the island. It was manned entirely by Negroes. They went to work and cut a stairway in the rock face of the island and erected on the summit a number of low-lying shacks in the fashion known in Jamaica as Waddle and Dog. They appeared to be completely equipped with provisions, and all they purchased from the fishermen of the bay was fresh fruit and water. They were a taciturn and orderly lot who gave no trouble, 
They explained to the customs which they had cleared in the neighboring Port Maria that they were there to catch tropical fish, especially the poisonous varieties, and collect rare shells for Ouroboros Inc. in St. Petersburg. When they had established themselves they purchased large quantities of these from the Shark Bay, Port Maria and Arakabesa fishermen. For a week they carried out blasting operations on the island and it was given out that these were for the purpose of excavating a large fish tank. The Secatur began a fortnightly shuttle service with the Gulf of Mexico, and watchers with binoculars confirmed that, before each sailing, consignments of portable fish tanks were taken aboard. Always half a dozen men were left behind. Canoes approaching the island were warned off by a watchman, at the base of the steps in the cliff, who fished all day from a narrow jetty alongside which the Secatur on her visits moored with two anchors out, well sheltered from the prevailing northeasterly winds. No one succeeded in landing on the island by daylight and, after two tragic attempts, nobody tried to gain access by night. The first attempt was made by local fishermen spurred on by the rumors of buried treasure that no talk of tropical fish could suppress. He had swum out one dark night and his body had been washed back over the reef next day. Sharks and barracuda had left nothing but the trunk and the remains of a thigh. At about the time he should have reached the island the whole village of shark bay was awakened by the most horrible drumming noise it seemed to come from inside the island it was recognized as the beating of voodoo drums it started softly and rose slowly to a thunderous crescendo then it died down again and stopped it lasted about five minutes j from that moment the island was juju or obia as it is called high jamaica and even in daylight canoes kept at a safe distance by this time Strangways was interested and he made a full report to London. Since 1950, Jamaica had become an important strategic target, thanks to the development by Reynolds Metal and the Kaiser Corporation of huge bauxite deposits found on the island. So far as Strangways was concerned, the activities on Surprise might easily be the erection of a base for one-man submarines in the event of war, particularly since Shark Bay was within range of the route followed by the Reynolds ships to the new bauxite harbour at Ocho Rios, a few miles down the coast. London. Followed the report up with. Washington. And it came to light that the. New York. Syndicate that had purchased the island was wholly owned by Mr. Big. This was three months ago. Strangways was ordered to penetrate the island at all costs and find out what was going on. He mounted quite an operation. He rented a property on the western arm of Shark Bay, called Bow Desert. It contained the ruins of one of the famous Jamaican great houses of the early 19th century and also a modern beach house directly across from the Secature's anchorage up against Surprise. He brought down two very fine swimmers from the naval base at Bermuda, and set up a permanent watch on the island through day and night glasses. Nothing of a suspicious nature was seen and on a dark calm night he sent out the two swimmers with instructions to make an underwater survey of the foundations of the island. Strangways described his horror when, an hour after they had left to swim across the 300 yards of water, the terrible drumming had started up somewhere inside the cliffs of the island. That night the two men did not return. On the next day they were both washed up at different parts of the bay. Or rather, the remains left by the shark and barracuda. At this point in Strangways's narrative, Bond interrupted him. Just a minute, he said. What's all this about shark and barracuda? They're not generally savage in these waters. There aren't very many of them round. Jamaica. And they don't often feed at night. Anyway, I don't believe either of them attack humans unless there's blood in the water. Occasionally they might snap at a white foot out of curiosity. Have they ever behaved like this round? Jamaica. Before. Never been a case since a girl got a foot bitten off in. Kingston. Harbor in 1942, said Strangways. She was being towed by a speedboat, flipping her feet up and down. The white feet must have looked particularly appetizing. Traveling at just the right speed too. Everyone agrees with your theory. And my men had harpoons and knives. I thought I'd done everything to protect them. Dreadful business. You can imagine how I felt about it. 
Since then we've done nothing except try to get legitimate access to the island via the colonial office in Washington. You see, it belongs to an American now. Damn slow business, particularly as there's nothing against these people. They seem to have pretty good protection in Washington and some smart international lawyers. We're absolutely stuck. London. Told me to hang on until you came. Strangways took a pull at his whiskey and looked expectantly at Bond. What are the Secature's movements? Asked Bond. Still in. Cuba. Sailing in about a week, according to the CIA. How many trips has she done? About 20. Bond multiplied $150,000 by 20. If his guess was right, Mr. Big had already taken a million pounds in gold out of the island. I've made some provisional arrangements for you, said Strangways. There's the house at Bo. Desert. I've got you a car, Sunbeam Talbot Coupe. New tires. Fast. Right car for these roads. I've got a good man to act as your factotum. A Cayman Islander called Quarrel. Best swimmer and fisherman in the Caribbean. Terribly keen. Nice chap. And I've borrowed the West Indian Citrus Company's rest house at Manatee Bay. It's the other end of the island. You could rest up there for a week and get in a bit of training until the secature comes in. You'll need to be fit if you're going to try to get over to surprise, and I honestly believe that's the only answer. Anything else I can do? I'll be about, of course, but I'll have to stay around. Kingston. To keep up communications with. London. And. Washington. They'll want to know everything we do. Anything else you'd like me to fix up? Bond had been making up his mind. Yes, he said, you might ask. London. To get the Admiralty to lend us one of their frogman suits complete with compressed air bottles. Plenty of spares, and a couple of good underwater harpoon guns. The French ones called, Champion, are the best. Good underwater torch, a commando dagger, all the dope they can get from the Natural History Museum on Barracuda and Shark and some of that shark-repellent stuff the Americans used in the Pacific. Ask BOAC to fly it all out on their direct service. Bond paused. Oh yes, he said. And one of those things our saboteurs used against ships in the war. Limpet mine, with assorted fuses. Live and let die. Chapter 17. The Undertaker's Wind. Pa Pa with a slice of green lime, a dish piled with red bananas purple star apples and tangerines, scrambled eggs and bacon. Blue. Mountain. Coffee, the most delicious in the world, Jamaican marmalade, almost black, and guava jelly. As Bond, wearing shorts and sandals, had his breakfast on the veranda and gazed down on the sunlit panorama of Kingston and Port Royal, he thought how lucky he was and what wonderful moments of consolation there were for the darkness and danger of his profession. Bond knew. Jamaica. Well, he had been there on a long assignment just after the war when the communist headquarters in Cuba was trying to infiltrate the Jamaican labor unions. It had been an untidy and inconclusive job but he had grown to love the great Green Island and its staunch, humorous people. Now he was glad to be back and to have a whole week of respite before the grim work began again. After breakfast, Strangways appeared on the veranda with a tall brown-skinned man in a faded blue shirt and old brown twill trousers. This was Quarrel, the Cayman Islander, and Bond liked him immediately. There was the blood of Cromwellian soldiers and buccaneers in him and his face was strong and angular and his mouth was almost severe. His eyes were gray. It was only the spatulate nose and the pale palms of his hands that were negroid. Bond shook him by the hand. Good morning, Captain, said Quarrel. Coming from the most famous race of seamen in the world, this was the highest title he knew. But there was no desire to please, or humility, in his voice. He was speaking as mate of the ship and his manner was straightforward and candid. That moment defined their relationship. It remained that of a Scots laird with his head stalker. Authority was unspoken and there was no room for servility. After discussing their plans, Bond took the wheel of the little car Quarrel had brought up from Kingston. And they started on up the Junction Road, leaving Strangways to busy himself with Bond's requirements. They had got off before nine and it was still cool as they crossed the mountains that run along 
Jamaica. S back like the central ridges of a crocodile's armor. The road wound down towards the northern plains through some of the most beautiful scenery in the world, the tropical vegetation changing with the altitude. The green flanks of the uplands, all feathered with bamboo interspersed with the dark, blending green of breadfruit and the sudden. Bengal. Fire of flame of the forest. Gave way to the lower forests of ebony, mahogany, maho and logwood. And when they reached the plains of Agualta Vale the green sea of sugar cane and bananas stretched away to where the distant fringe of glittering shrapnel bursts marked the palm groves along the north coast. Coral was a good companion on the drive and a wonderful guide. He talked about the trapdoor spiders as they passed through the famous palm gardens of Castle Tun. He told Ab of it a fight he had witnessed between a giant centipede and a scorpion and he explained the difference between the male and female pawpaw. He described the poisons of the forest and the healing properties of tropical herbs, the pressure the palm kernel develops to break open its coconut, the length of a hummingbird's tongue, and how crocodiles carry their young in their mouths laid lengthways like sardines in a tin. He spoke exactly but without expertise, using Jamaican language in which plants strive, or quail, moths or bats, and love is used instead of like. As he talked he would raise his hand in greeting to the people on the road and they would wave back and shout his name. You seem to know a lot of people, said Bond as the driver of a bulging bus with romance in large letters over the windshield gave him a couple of welcoming blasts on his wind horn. I been watching surprise for three months, Cap'n, answered Quarrel, and I been traveling this road twice a week. Everyone soon know you in. Jamaica. They got good eyes. By half past ten they had passed through Port Maria and branched off along the little parochial road that runs down to Shark Bay. Round a turning they suddenly came on it below them and Bond stopped the car and they got out. The bay was crescent-shaped, perhaps three quarters of a mile wide at its arms. Its blue surface was ruffled by a light breeze blowing from the northeast, the edge of the trade winds that are borne five hundred miles away in the Gulf of Mexico and then go on their long journey round the world. A mile from where they stood, a long line of breakers showed the reef just outside the bay and the narrow untroubled waters of the passage which was the only entrance to the anchorage. In the center of the crescent, the Isle of Surprise rose a hundred feet sheer out of the water, small waves creaming against its easterly base, calm waters in its lee. It was nearly round, and it looked like a tall gray cake topped with green icing on a blue china plate. They had stopped about a hundred feet above the little cluster of fishermen's huts behind the palm-fringed beach of the bay and they were level with the flat green top of the island, half a mile away. Coral pointed out the thatched roofs of the wattle and dog shanties among the trees in the center of the island. Bond examined them through Coral's binoculars. There was no sign of life except a thin wisp of smoke blowing away with the breeze. Below them, the water of the bay was pale green on the white sand. Then it deepened to dark blue just before the broken brown of a submerged fringe of inner reef that made a wide semicircle a hundred yards from the island. Then it was dark blue again with patches of lighter blue and aquamarine. Coral said that the depth of the secature's anchorage was about thirty feet. To their left, in the middle of the western arms of the bay, deep among the trees behind a tiny white sand beach, was their base of operations. Bow. Desert. Coral described its layout and Bond stood for ten minutes examining the three hundred yard stretch of sea between it and the secature's anchorage up against the island. In all, Bond spent an hour reconnoitering the place, then, without going near their house or the village, they turned the car and got back on the main coast road. They drove on through the beautiful little banana port of Aracabesa and Ocho Rios with its huge new bauxite plant, along the north shore to Montego Bay. Two hours away. It was now February and the season was in full swing. The little village and the straggle of large hotels were bathed in the four months gold rush that seized them through the whole year. They stopped at a rest house on the other side of the wide bay and had lunch and then drove on through the heat of the afternoon to the western tip of the island, two hours further on. Here, because of the huge coastal swamps, nothing has happened since. Columbus. Used. Manatee. Bay. As a casual anchorage, Jamaican fishermen have taken the place of the Arawak Indians, but otherwise there is the impression that time has stood still. Bond thought it the most beautiful beach he had ever seen, 
five miles of white sand sloping easily into the breakers and, behind, the palm trees marching in graceful disarray to the horizon. Under them, the gray canoes were pulled up beside pink mounds of discarded conch shells, and among them smoke rose from the palm thatch cabins of the fishermen in the shade between the swamp lands and the sea. In a clearing among the cabins, set on a rough lawn of Bahama grass, was the house on stilts built as a weekend cottage for the employees of the West Indian Citrus Company. It was built on stilts to keep the termites at bay and it was closely wired against mosquito and sand fly. Bond drove off the rough track and parked under the house. While Quarrel chose two rooms and made them comfortable Bond put a towel round his waist and walked through the palm trees to the sea, twenty yards away. For an hour he swam and lazed in the warm buoyant water, thinking of surprise and its secret, fixing these three hundred yards in his mind, wondering about the shark and barracuda and the other hazards of the sea, that great library of books one cannot read. Walking back to the little wooden bungalow, Bond picked up his first sandfly bites. Quarrel chuckled when he saw the flat bumps on his back that would soon start to itch maddeningly. Can't do nothing to keep them away, Cap'n, he said. But ah kin stop them ticklin'. You best take a shower first to get the salt off. They only bites hard for an hour in the evening and then they like salt with their dinner. When Bond came out of the shower Quarrel produced an old medicine bottle and swabbed the bites with a brown liquid that smelled of creosote. We get more skeeters and sandfly in the Caymans than anywheres else in the world, he said, but we gives them no attention so long as we got this medicine. The ten minutes of tropical twilight brought its quick melancholy and then the stars and the three-quarter moon blazed down and the sea died to a whisper. There was the short lull between the two great winds of Jamaica. And then the palms began to whisper again. Quarrel jerked his head towards the window. Duh. Undertaker's wind, he commented. How's that? asked Bond, startled. On an offshore breeze de sailors call it, said Quarrel. De undertaker blowed a bad air out of de island. Night times from six, till six, then every morning de doctor's wind, come and blow de sweet air in from de sea. Leastwise dat's what we calls dem in. Jamaica. Dot single quote. Quarrel looked quizzically at Bond. Guess you and the undertaker's wind got much the same job, Cap'n, he said half seriously. Bond laughed shortly, glad I don't have to keep the same hours, he said. Outside, the crickets and the tree frogs started to zing and tinkle and the great hawk moths came to the wire netting across the windows and clutched it, gazing with trembling ecstasy at the two oil lamps that hung from the cross beams inside. Occasionally a pair of fishermen, or a group of giggling girls, would walk by down the beach on their way to the single tiny rum shop at the point of the bay. No man walked alone for fear of the duppies under the trees, or the rolling calf, the ghastly animal that comes rolling towards you along the ground, its legs in chains and flames coming out of its nostrils. While Quarrel prepared one of the succulent meals of fish and eggs and vegetables that were to be their staple diet, Bond sat under the light and pored over the books that Strangways had borrowed from the Jamaica Institute books on the tropical sea and its denizens by Beebe and Allen and others, and on submarine hunting by Gusto and Hass. When he set out to cross those three hundred yards of sea, he was determined to do it expertly and to leave nothing to chance. He knew the caliber of Mr. Big and he guessed that the defenses of surprise would be technically brilliant. He thought they would not involve simple weapons like guns and high explosives. Mr. Big needed to work undisturbed by the police. He had to keep out of reach of the law. He guessed that somehow the forces of the sea had been harnessed to do the big man's work for him and it was on these that he concentrated, on murder by shark and barracuda, perhaps by manta ray and octopus. The facts set out by the naturalists were chilling and awe-inspiring, but the experiences of Cousteau in the Mediterranean, and of Haas in the Red Sea, and Caribbean, were more encouraging. That night Bond's dreams were full of terrifying encounters with giant squids and sting rays, hammerheads and the saw teeth of barracuda, so that he whimpered and sweated in his sleep. On the next day he started his training under the critical, appraising eyes of Quarrel. Every morning he swam a mile up the beach before breakfast and then ran back along the firm sand to the bungalow. At about nine they would set out in a canoe, the single triangular sail taking them fast through the water up the coast too. Bloody. Bay. And. Orange. Bay. 
where the sand ends in cliffs and small coves and the reef is close in against the coast. Here they would beach the canoe and Quarrel would take him out with spears and masks and an old underwater harpoon gun on breathtaking expeditions in the sort of waters he would encounter in. Shark. Bay. They hunted quietly, a few yards apart, Quarrel moving effortlessly in an element in which he was almost at home. Soon Bond too learned not to fight the sea but always to give and take with the currents and eddies and not to struggle against them, to use judo tactics in the water. On the first day he came home cut and poisoned by the coral and with a dozen sea egg spines in his side. Coral grinned and treated the wounds with Murthiolet and Milton. Then, as every evening, he massaged Bond for half an hour with palm oil, talking quietly the while about the fish they had seen that day explaining the habits of the carnivores and the ground feeders, the camouflage of fish and their machinery for changing color through the blood stream. He also had never known fish to attack a man except in desperation or because there was blood in the water. He explained that fish are rarely hungry in tropical waters and that most of their weapons are for defense and not for attack. The only exception, he admitted, was the barracuda. Mean fish, he called them, fearless since they knew no enemy except disease capable of 50 miles an hour over short distances, and with the worst battery of teeth of any fish in the sea. One day they shot a ten-pounder that had been hanging round them, melting into the grey distances and then reappearing, silent, motionless in the upper water, its angry tiger's eyes glaring at them so close that they could see its gills working softly and the teeth glinting like a wolf's along its cruel underslung jaw. Quarrel finally took the harpoon gun from Bond and shot it, badly, through the streamlined belly. It came straight for them, its jaws on their great hinges wide open like a striking rattlesnake. Bond made a wild lunge at it with his spear just as it was on to quarrel. He missed but the spear went between its jaws. They immediately snapped shut on the steel shaft, and as the fish tore the spear out of Bond's hand, quarrel stabbed at it with his knife and it went mad, dashing through the water with its entrails hanging out, the spear clenched between its teeth and the harpoon dangling from its body coral could scarcely hold the line as the fish tried to tear the wide barb through the walls of its stomach, but he moved with it towards a piece of submerged reef and climbed onto it and slowly pulled the fish in. When coral had cut its throat and they twisted the spear out of its jaws they found bright, deep scratches in the steel. They took the fish ashore and coral cut its head off and opened the jaws with a piece of wood. The upper jaw rose in an enormous gape, almost at right angles to the lower and revealed a fantastic battery of razor-sharp teeth, so crowded that they overlapped like shingles on a roof. Even the tongue had several runs of small pointed recurved teeth and, in front, there were two huge fangs that projected forward like a snake's. Although it only weighed just over ten pounds, it was over four feet long, a nickel bullet of muscle and hard flesh. We shoot no more kudas, said Quarrel. But for you I been in hospital for a month and maybe lost ma face. It was foolish of me. If we swim towards it, it gone away. They always do. They cowards like all fish. Don't you worry, bout those, he pointed at the teeth. You never see dem again. I hope not, said Bond. I haven't got a face to spare. By the end of the week, Bond was sunburned and hard. He had cut his cigarettes down to ten a day and had not had a single drink. He could swim two miles without tiring. His hand was completely healed and all the scales of big city life had fallen from him. Quarrel was pleased. You ready for surprise, Cap'n, he said, and I not like be the fish what tries to eat you. Towards nightfall on the eighth day they came back to the rest house to find Strangways waiting for them. I've got some good news for you, he said, your friend Felix Leiter's going to be all right. At all events he's not going to die. They've had to amputate the remains of an arm and a leg. Now the plastic surgery chaps have started building up his face. They called me up from St. Petersburg. Yesterday, apparently he insisted on getting a message to you. First thing he thought of when he could think at all. Says he's sorry not to be with you and to tell you not to get your feet wet, or at any rate, not as wet as he did. Bond's heart was full. He looked out of the window. Tell him to get well quickly he said abruptly. Tell him I miss him. He looked back into the room. Now what about the gear? Everything okay? I've got it all, said Strangways, and the secature sails tomorrow for surprise. After clearing at Port Maria, they should anchor before nightfall. Mr. Biggison board, 
Only the second time he's been down here. Oh and they've got a woman with them. Girl called Solitaire, according to the CIA. Know anything about her? Not much, said Bond. But I'd like to get her away from him. She's not one of his team. Sort of damsel in distress, said the romantic Strangways. Good show. According to the CIA she's a corker. But Bond had gone out on the veranda and was gazing up at his stars. Never before in his life had there been so much to play for. The secret of the treasure, the defeat of a great criminal, the smashing of a communist spy ring, and the destruction of a tentacle of Smirsh, the cruel machine that was his own private target. And now Solitaire, the ultimate personal prize. The stars winked down their cryptic morse and he had no key to their cipher. Live and let die. Chapter 18. Bo. Desert. Strangeways went back alone after dinner and Bond agreed that they would follow at first light. Strangways left him a fresh pile of books and pamphlets on shark and barracuda and Bond went through them with rapt attention. They added little to the practical lore he had picked up from Quarrel. They were all by scientists and much of the data on attacks was from the beaches of the Pacific where a flashing body in the thick surf would excite any inquisitive fish. But there seemed to be general agreement that the danger to underwater swimmers with breathing equipment was far less than to surface swimmers. They might be attacked by almost any of the shark family, particularly when the shark was stimulated and excited by blood in the water, by the smell of a swimmer or by the sensory vibration set up by an injured person in the water. But they could sometimes be frightened off, he read, by loud noises in the water, even by shouting below the surface, and they would often flee if a swimmer chased them. The most successful form of shark repellent, according to U.S. Naval Research Laboratory tests, was a combination of copper acetate and a dark negrosine dye, and cakes of this mixture were apparently now attached to the May Wests of all the U.S. armed forces. Bond called in quarrel. The Cayman Islander was scornful until Bond read out to him what the Navy Department had to say about their researches at the end of the war among packs of sharks stimulated by what was described as extreme mob behavior conditions. Sharks were attracted to the back of the shrimp boat with trash fish, read out Bond. Sharks appeared as a slashing, splashing shoal. We prepared a tub of fresh fish and another tub of fish mixed with repellent powder. We got up to the shoal of sharks and the photographer started his camera. I shoveled over the plain fish for 30 seconds while the sharks, with much splashing, ate them. Then I started on the repellent fish and shoveled for 30 seconds repeating the procedure three times. On the first trial the sharks were quite ferocious in feeding on plain fish right at the stern of the boat. They cut fish for only about five seconds after the repellent mixture was thrown over. A few came back when the plain fish were put out immediately following the repellent. On a second trial 30 minutes later, a ferocious school fed for the 30 seconds that plain fish were supplied, but left as soon as the repellent struck the water. There were no attacks on fish while the repellent was in the water. On the third trial we could not get the sharks nearer than 20 yards of the stern of the boat. What do you make of that? asked Bond. You better have some of dat stuff, said Quarrel, impressed against his will. Bond was inclined to agree with him. Washington had cabled that cakes of the stuff were on the way, but they had not yet arrived and were not expected for another 48 hours. If the repellent did not arrive, Bond was not dismayed. He could not imagine that he would encounter such dangerous conditions in his underwater swim to the island. Before he went to bed, he finally decided that nothing would attack him unless there was blood in the water or unless he communicated fear to a fish that threatened. As for octopus, scorpion fish and mores, he would just have to watch where he put his feet. To his mind, the three-inch spines of the black sea eggs were the greatest hazard to normal underwater swimming in the tropics and the pain they caused would not be enough to interfere with his plans. They left before six in the morning and were at Bow Desert by half past ten. The property was a beautiful old plantation of about a thousand acres with the ruins of a fine great house commanding the bay. It was given over to pimento and citrus inside a fringe of hardwoods and palms and had a history dating back to the time of Cromwell. The romantic name was in the fashion of the 18th century, when Jamaican properties were called Bel Air. Bellevue. Boscobel, Harmony, Nymphenburg or had names like Prospect, Content or Repose. A track, out of sight of the island in the bay, led them among the trees down to the little beach house. 
after the week's picnic at Manatee Bay. The bathrooms and comfortable bamboo furniture seemed very luxurious and the brightly colored rugs were like velvet under Bond's hardened feet. Through the slats of the Jalousies Bond looked across the little garden, aflame with hibiscus, bougainvillea and roses, which ended in the tiny crescent of white sand half obscured by the trunks of the palms. He sat on the arm of a chair and let his eyes go on, inch by inch, across the different blues and browns of sea and reef until they met the base of the island. The upper half of it was obscured by the dipping feathers of the palm trees in the foreground, but the stretch of vertical cliff within his vision looked gray and formidable in the half-shadow cast by the hot sun. Quarrel cooked lunch on a primus stove so that no smoke would betray them, and in the afternoon Bond slept and then went over the gear from London. That had been sent across from Kingston. By Strangways. He tried on the thin black rubber frogman suit that covered him from the skull-tight helmet with the perspex window to the long black flippers over his feet. It fitted like a glove and Bond blessed the efficiency of M's, Q, branch. They tested the twin cylinders each containing a thousand liters of free air compressed to 200 atmospheres and Bond found the manipulation of the demand valve and the reserve mechanism simple and foolproof. At the depth he would be working the supply of air would last him for nearly two hours underwater. There was a new and powerful champion harpoon gun and a commando dagger of the type devised by Wilkinson's during the war. Finally, in a box covered with danger labels, there was the heavy limpet mine, a flat cone of explosive on a base, studded with wide copper bosses, so powerfully magnetized that the mine would stick like a clam to any metal hull. There were a dozen pencil-shaped metal and glass fuses set for ten minutes to eight hours and a careful memorandum of instructions that were as simple as the rest of the gear. There was even a box of benzedrine tablets to give endurance and heightened perception during the operation and an assortment of underwater torches, including one that threw only a tiny pencil-thin beam. Bond and Quarrel went through everything, testing joints and contacts until they were satisfied that nothing further remained to be done, then Bond went down among the trees and gazed and gazed at the waters of the bay, guessing at depths, tracing roots through the broken reef and estimating the path of the moon which would be his only point of reckoning on the tortuous journey. At 5 o'clock, Strangways arrived with news of the secature. They've cleared Port Maria, he said. They'll be here in ten minutes at the outside. Mr. Big had a passport in the name of Gallia, and the girl in the name of Luttrell, Simone Luttrell. She was in her cabin, prostrate with what the Negro captain of the secature described as seasickness. It may have been scores of empty fish tanks on board. More than a hundred, otherwise nothing suspicious and they were given a clean bill. I wanted to go on board as one of the customs team but I thought it best that the show should be absolutely normal. Mr. Big stuck to his cabin. He was reading when they went to see his papers. How's the gear? Perfect, said Bond. Guess we'll operate tomorrow night. Hope there's a bit of a wind. If the air bubbles are spotted we shall be in a mess. Quarrel came in. She's coming through the reef now, Cap'n. They went down as close to the shore as they dared and put their glasses on her. She was a handsome craft, black with a gray superstructure, 70 foot long and built for speed, at least 20 knots, Bond guessed. He knew her history, built for a millionaire in 1947 and powered with twin General Motors diesels, steel hull and all the latest wireless gadgets, including ship-to-shore telephone and deck a navigator. She was wearing the red ensign at her cross trees and the stars and stripes aft and she was making about three knots through the twenty-foot opening of the reef. She turned sharply inside the reef and came down to seaward of the island. When she was below it, she put her helm hard over and came up with the island to port. All the same time three negroes in white ducks came running down the cliff steps to the narrow jetty and stood by to catch lines. There was a minimum of backing and filling before she was made fast just opposite to the watchers ashore, and the two anchors roared down among the rocks and coral scattered round the island's foundations in the sand. She lay well secured even against a norther. Bond estimated there would be about twenty feet of water below her keel. As they watched, the huge figure of Mr. Big appeared on deck. He stepped onto the jetty and started slowly to climb the steep cliff steps. He paused often and Bond thought of the diseased heart pumping laboriously in the Giat gray black body. He was followed by two Negro members of the crew hauling up a light stretcher on which a body was strapped. Through his glasses Bond could see Solitaire's black hair, 
Bond was worried and puzzled and he felt a tightening of the heart at her nearness. He prayed the stretcher was only a precaution to prevent Solitaire from being recognized from the shore. Then a chain of twelve men was established up the steps and the fish tanks were handed up one by one. Quarrel counted a hundred and twenty of them. Then some stores went up by the same method. Not taking much up this time, commented Strangways when the operation ceased. Only half a dozen cases gone up. Generally about fifty. Can't be staying long. He had hardly finished speaking before a fish tank, which their glasses showed was half full of water and sand, was being gingerly passed back to the ship, down the human ladder of hands. Then another and another, at about five minute intervals. My God, said Strangways. They're loading her up already. That means they'll be sailing in the morning. Wonder if it means they've decided to clean the place out and that this is the last cargo. Bond watched carefully for a while and then they walked quietly up through the trees, leaving Quarrel to report developments. They sat down in the living room, and while Strangways mixed himself a whiskey and soda, Bond gazed out of the window and marshaled his thoughts. It was six o'clock, and the fireflies were beginning to show in the shadows. The pale primrose moon was already high up in the eastern sky and the day was dying swiftly at their backs. A light breeze was ruffling the bay and the scrolls of small waves were unfurling on the white beach across the lawn. A few small clouds, pink and orange in the sunset, were meandering by overhead and the palm trees clashed softly in the cool Undertaker's wind. Undertaker's wind, thought Bond and smiled wryly. So it would have to be tonight. The only chance, and the conditions were so nearly perfect. Except that the shark repellent stuff would not arrive in time. And that was only a refinement. There was no excuse. This was what he had traveled 2,000 miles and five deaths to do. And yet he shivered at the prospect of the dark adventure under the sea that he had already put off in his mind until tomorrow. Suddenly he loathed and feared the sea and everything in it. The millions of tiny antennae that would stir and point as he went by that night, the eyes that would wake and watch him, the pulses that would miss for the hundredth of a second and then go beating quietly on, the jelly tendrils that would grope and reach for him as blind in the light as in the dark. He would be walking through thousands of millions of secrets. In three hundred yards, alone and cold, he would be blundering through a forest of mystery towards a deadly citadel whose guardians had already killed three men. He, Bond, after a week's paddling with his nanny beside him in the sunshine, was going out tonight, in a few hours, to walk alone under that black sheet of water. It was crazy, unthinkable. Bond's flesh cringed and his fingers dug into his wet palms. There was a knock on the door and Quarrel came in. Bond was glad to get up and move away from the window to where Strangways was enjoying his drink under a shaded reading light. They're working with lights now, Cap'n, Quarrel said with a grin. Still a tank every five minutes. I figure that'll be ten hours work. Be through about four in the morning. Won't sail before six. Too dangerous to try the passage without plenty light. Quarrel's warm gray eyes in the splendid mahogany face were looking into Bond's, waiting for orders. I'll start at ten sharp, Bond found himself saying. From the rocks to the left of the beach. Can you get us some dinner and then get the gear out onto the lawn? Conditions are perfect, I'll be over there in half an hour. He counted on his fingers. Give me fuses for five to eight hours. And the quarter hour one in reserve in case any, thing goes wrong. Okay. Aye aye. Cap'n, said Quarrel. You geez leave them all to me. He went out. Bond looked at the whiskey bottle, then he made up his mind and poured half a glass on top of three ice cubes. He took the box of Benzedrine tablets out of his pocket and slipped a tablet between his teeth. Here's luck, he said to Strangways and took a deep swallow. He sat down and enjoyed the tough hot taste of his first drink for more than a week. Now, he said, Tell me exactly what they do when they're ready to sail. How long it takes them to clear the island and get through the reef. If it's the last time, don't forget they'll be taking off an extra six men and some stores. Let's try to work it out as closely as we can. In a moment Bond was immersed in a sea of practical details and the shadow of fear had fled back to the dark pools under the palm trees. Exactly at 10 o'clock. With nothing but anticipation and excitement in him. The shimmering black bat-like figure slipped off the rocks into ten feet of water and vanished under the sea. Go safely, said Quarrel to the spot where Bond had disappeared. 
he crossed himself. Then he and Strangways moved back through the shadows to the house to sleep uneasily in watches and wait fearfully for what might come. Live and let die. Chapter 19. Valley. Of. Shadows. Bond was carried straight to the bottom by the weight of the limpet mine that he had secured to his chest with tapes and by the leaded belt which he wore round his waist to correct the buoyancy of the compressed air cylinders. He didn't pause for an instant but immediately streaked across the first fifty yards of open sand in a fast crawl, his face just above the sand. The long webbed feet would almost have doubled his normal speed if he had not been hampered by the weight he was carrying and by the light harpoon gun in his left hand but he traveled fast and in under a minute he came to rest in the shadow of a mass of sprawling coral. He paused and examined his sensations. He was warm in the rubber suit, warmer than he would have been swimming in the sunshine. He found his movements very easy and breathing perfectly simple so long as his breath was even and relaxed. He watched the telltale bubbles streaming up against the coral in a fountain of silver pearls and prayed that the small waves were hiding them. In the open he had been able to see perfectly. The light was soft and milky but not strong enough to melt the mackerel shadows of the surface waves that checkered the sand. Now, up against the reef, there was no reflection from the bottom, and the shadows under the rocks were black and impenetrable. He risked a quick glance with his pencil torch and immediately the underbelly of the mass of brown tree coral came alive. Anemones with crimson centers waved their velvet tentacles at him. A colony of black sea eggs moved their Toledo steel spines in sudden alarm and a hairy sea centipede halted in its hundred strides and questioned with its eyeless head. In the sand at the base of the tree a toad fish softly drew its hideous warty head back into its funnel and a number of flower-like sea worms whisked out of sight down their gelatinous tubes. A covey of bejeweled butterfly and angel fish flirted into the light and he marked the flat spiral of a long-spined star shell. Bond tucked the light back in his belt. Above him the surface of the sea was a canopy of quicksilver. It crackled softly like fat frying in a saucepan. Ahead the moonlight glinted down into the deep crooked valley that sloped down and away on the route he had to follow. He left his sheltering tree of coral and walked softly forward. Now it was not so easy. The light was tricky and bad and the petrified forest of the coral reef was full of culls de sac and tempting but misleading avenues. Sometimes he had to climb almost to the surface to get over a tangled scrub of tree and antler coral and when this happened he profited by it to check his position with the moon that glowed like a huge pale rocket burst through the broken water. Sometimes the hourglass waste of a niggerhead gave him shelter and he rested for a few moments knowing that the small froth of his air bubbles would be hidden by the jagged knob protruding above the surface. Then he would focus his eyes on the phosphorescent scribbles of the minute underwater nightlife and perceive whole colonies and populations about their microscopic business. There were no big fish about, but many lobsters were out of their holes looking huge and prehistoric in the magnifying lens of the water. Their stock-like eyes glared redly at him and their foot-long-spined antennae asked him for the password. Occasionally they scuttled nervously backwards into their shelters, their powerful tails kicking up the sand and crouched on the tips of their eight hairy feet, waiting for the danger to pass. Once the great streamers of a Portuguese man of war floated slowly by. They almost reached his head from the surface, fifteen feet away, and he remembered the whiplash of a sting from the contact of one of their tendrils that had burned for three of his days at Manatee Bay. If they caught a man across the heart they could kill him. He saw several green and speckled moray eels, the latter moving like big yellow and black snakes along patches of sand, the green ones baring their teeth from some hole in the rock, and several West Indian blowfish, like brown owls with huge soft green eyes. He poked at one with the end of his gun and it swelled out to the size of a football and became a mass of dangerous white spines. Wide sea fans swayed and beckoned in the eddies, and in the grey valleys they caught the light of the moon and waved spectrally, like fragments of the shrouds of men buried at sea. Often in the shadows there were unexplained, heavy movements and swirls in the water and the sudden glare of large eyes at once extinguished. Then Bond would whirl round, thumbing up the safety catch on his harpoon gun, and stare back into the darkness. But he shot at nothing and nothing attacked him as he scrambled and slithered through the reef. The hundred yards of coral took him a quarter of an hour. When he got through and rested on a round lump of brain coral under the shelter of a last niggerhead, he was glad that nothing but a hundred yards of grey-white water lay in front of him. He still felt perfectly fresh and the elation and clarity of mind produced by the benzedrine were still with him, 
but the gauntlet of hazards through the reef had been a constant fret, with the risk of tearing his rubber skin always on his mind. Now the forest of razor blade coral was behind, to be exchanged for shark and barracuda or perhaps a sudden stick of dynamite dropped into the center of the little flower of his bubbles on the surface. It was while he was measuring the dangers ahead that the octopus got him. Round both ankles. He had been sitting with his feet on the sand and suddenly they were manacled to the base of the round toadstool of coral on which he was resting. Even as he realized what had happened a tentacle began to snake up his leg and another one, purple in the dim light, wandered down his webbed left foot. He gave a start of fear and disgust and at once he was on his feet, shuffling and straining to get away. But there was no inch of yield and his movements only gave the octopus an opportunity to pull his heels tighter under the overhang of the round rock. The strength of the brute was prodigious and Bond could feel his balance going fast. In a moment he would be pulled down flat on his face and then, hampered by the mine on his chest and the cylinders on his back, it might be almost impossible to get at the beast. Bond snatched his dagger out of his belt and jabbed down between his legs. But the overhang of the rock impeded him and he was terrified of cutting his rubber skin. Suddenly he was toppled over, lying on the sand. At once his feet began to be drawn into a wide lateral cleft under the rock. He scrabbled at the sand and tried to curl round to get within range with the dagger. But the thick hump of the mine protruding from his chest prevented him. On the edge of panic, he remembered the harpoon gun. Before, he had dismissed it as being a hopeless weapon at that short range, but now it was the only chance. It lay on the sand where he had left it. He reached for it and put up the safety catch. The mine prevented him from aiming. He slid the barrel along his legs and probed each of his feet with the tip of the harpoon to find the gap between them. At once a tentacle seized the steel tip and began tugging. The gun slipped between his manacled feet and he pulled the trigger blindly. Immediately a great cloud of viscous, stringy ink rolled out of the cleft towards his face. But one leg was free and then the other and he whipped them round and under him and seized the haft of the three-foot harpoon where it disappeared under the rock. He pulled and strained until, with a rending of flesh, it came away from the black fog that hung over the hole. Panting, he got up and stood away from the rock, the sweat pouring down his face under the mask. Above him, the tell-tale stream of silver bubbles rose straight to the surface and he cursed the wounded, pus feller, in its lair. But there was no time to worry further with it and he reloaded his gun and struck out with the moon over his right shoulder. Now he made good going through the misty gray water and he concentrated only on keeping his face a few inches above the sand and his head well down to streamline his body. Once, out of the corner of his eye, he saw a stingray as big as a ping-pong table shuffle out of his path, the tip of its great speckled wings beating like a bird's, its long horned tail streaming out behind it. But he paid it no attention, remembering that Quarrel had said that rays never attack except in self-defense. He reflected that it had probably come in over the outer reef to lay its eggs, or mermaids, purses as the fishermen call them, because they are shaped like a pillow with a stiff black string at each corner, on the sheltered sandy bottom. Many shadows of big fish lazed across the moonlit sand, some as long as himself. When one followed beside him for at least a minute he looked up to see the white belly of a shark ten feet above him like a glaucous tapering airship. Its blunt nose was buried inquisitively in his stream of air bubbles. The wide sickle slit of its mouth looked like a puckered scar. It leant sideways and glanced down at him out of one hard pink naked eye, then it wobbled its great scythe-shaped tail and moved slowly into the wall of grey mist. He frightened a family of squids, ranging from about six pounds down to an infant of six ounces, frail and luminous in the half-light, hanging almost vertical in a diminishing chorus line. They righted themselves and shot off with streamlined jet propulsion. Bond rested for a moment about halfway and then went on. Now there were barracuda about, big ones of up to twenty pounds. They looked just as deadly as he had remembered them. They glided above him like silver submarines, looking down out of then, angry tiger's eyes. They were curious about him and about his bubbles and they followed him, around and above him, like a pack of silent wolves. By the time Bond met the first bit of coral that meant he was coming up with the island there must have been twenty of them moving quietly, watchfully in and out of the opaque wall that enclosed him. Bond's skin cringed under the black rubber but he could do nothing about them and he concentrated on his objective. Suddenly there was a long metallic shape hanging in the water above him. 
Behind it there was a jumble of broken rock leading steeply upwards. It was the keel of the secature and Bond's heart thumped in his chest. He looked at the Rolex watch on his wrist. It was three minutes past. Eleven o'clock. He selected the seven-hour fuse from the handful he extracted from a zipped side pocket and inserted it in the fuse pocket of the mine and pushed it home. The rest of the fuses he buried in the sand so that if he was captured the mine would not be betrayed. As he swam up, carrying the mine between his hands, bottom upwards, he was aware of a commotion in the water behind him. A barracuda flashed by, its jaws half open, almost hitting him, its eyes fixed on something at his back. But Bond was intent only on the center of the ship's keel and on a point about three feet above it. The mine almost dragged him the last few feet, its huge magnets straining for the metallic kiss with the hull. Bond had to pull hard against it to prevent the clang of contact. Then it was silently in place and with its weight removed Bond had to swim strongly to counter his new buoyancy and get down again and away from the surface. It was as he turned to swim towards the twin propellers on his way to the shelter of the rocks that he suddenly saw the terrible things that had been going on behind him. The great pack of barracudas seemed to have gone mad. They were whirling and snapping in the water like hysterical dogs. Three sharks that had joined them were charging through the water with a clumsier frenzy. The water was boiling with the dreadful fish and Bond was slammed in the face and buffeted again and again within a few yards. At any moment he knew his rubber skin would be torn with the flesh below it and then the pack would be on him. Extreme mob behavior conditions. The Navy Department's phrase flashed into his mind. This was just when he might have saved himself with the shark repellent stuff. Without it he might only have a few more minutes to live. In desperation he threshed through the water along the ship's keel, the safety catch up on the harpoon gun that was now only a toy in the face of this drove of maddened cannibal fish. He reached the two big copper screws and clung to one of them, panting, his lips drawn back from his teeth in a snarl of fear, his eyes distended as he faced the frenzy of the boiling sea around him. He at once saw that the mouths of the hurtling, darting fish were half open and that they were plunging in and out of a brownish cloud, spreading downwards from the surface. Close to him a barracuda hung for an instant, something brown and glittering in its jaws. It gave a great swallow and then swirled back into the melee. At the same time he noticed that it was getting darker. He looked up and saw with dawning comprehension that the quicksilver surface of the sea had turned red, a horrible glinting crimson. Threads of the stuff drifted within his reach. He hooked some towards him with the end of his gun, held the end close up against his glass mask. There was no doubt about it. Up above, someone was spraying the surface of the sea with blood and awful. Live and let die. Chapter 20 Bloody Morgan's Cave Immediately Bond understood why all these barracuda and shark were lurking round the island, how they were kept frenzied with bloodlust by this nightly banquet, why, against all reason, the three men had been washed up half-eaten by the fish. Mr. Big had just harnessed the forces of the sea for his protection. It was a typical invention, imaginative, technically foolproof and very easy to operate. Even as Bond's mind grasped it all, Something hit him a terrific blow in the shoulder and a twenty-pound barracuda backed away, black rubber and flesh hanging from its jaws. Bond felt no pain as he let go of the bronze propeller and threshed wildly for the rocks, only a horrible sickness in the pit of his stomach at the thought of part of himself between those hundred razor-sharp teeth. Water started to ooze between the close-fitting rubber and his skin. It would not be long before it penetrated up his neck and into the mask. He was just going to give up and shoot the twenty feet to the surface when he saw a wide fissure in the rocks in front of him. Beside it a great boulder lay on its side and somehow he got behind it. He turned from the partial shelter it gave just in time to see the same barracuda coming at him again, its upper jaw held at right angles to the lower for its infamous gaping strike. Bond fired almost blind with the harpoon gun. The rubber thongs whammed down the barrel and the barbed harpoon caught the big fish in the center of its raised upper jaw, pierced it and stuck with half the shaft and the line still free. The barracuda stopped dead in its tracks, three feet from Bond's stomach. It tried to get its jaws together and then gave a mighty shake of its long reptile's head. Then it shot away, zigzagging madly, the gun and line, jerked from Bond's hand, streaming behind it. Bond knew that the other fish would be on to it tearing it to bits, before it had gone a hundred yards. Bond thanked God for the diversion. 
His shoulder was now surrounded by a cloud of blood. In a matter of seconds the other fish would catch the scent. He slipped round the boulder with the thought that he would scramble up under the shelter of the jetty and somehow hide himself above the level of the sea until he had made a fresh plan. Then he saw the cave that the boulder had hidden. It was really almost a door into the base of the island. If Bond had not been swimming for his life he could have walked in. As it was, he dived straight through the opening and only stopped when several yards separated him from the glimmering entrance. Then he stood upright on the soft sand and switched on his torch. A shark might conceivably come in after him but in the confined space it would be almost impossible for it to bring its underslung mouth to bear on him. It would certainly not come in with a rush for even the shark is frightened of hazarding its tough skin among rocks, and he would have plenty of chance of going for its eyes with his dagger. Bond shone his torch on the ceiling and sides of the cave. It had certainly been fashioned or finished by man. Bond guessed that it had been dug outwards from somewhere in the center of the island. At least another twenty yards to go, men, Bloody Morgan must have said to the slave overseers. And then the picks would have burst suddenly through to the sea in a welter of arms and legs and screaming mouths, gagged forever with water, would have hurtled back into the rock to join the bodies of other witnesses. The great boulder at the entrance would have been put in position to seal the seaward exit. The Shark Bay Fishermen who suddenly disappeared six months before must have one day found it rolled away by a storm or by the tidal wave following a hurricane. Then he had found the treasure and had known he would need help to dispose of it. A white man would cheat him. Better go to the great Negro gangster in Harlem and make the best terms he could. The gold belonged to the black men who had died to hide it. It should go back to the black men. Standing there, swaying in the slight current high the tunnel, Bond guessed that one more barrel of cement had splashed into the mud of the Harlem River. It was then that he heard the drums. Out amongst the big fish he had heard a soft thunder in the water that had grown as he entered the cave. But he had thought it was only the waves against the base of the island, and anyway he had had other things to think about. But now he could distinguish a definite rhythm and the sound boomed and swelled around him in a muffled roar as if he himself was imprisoned inside a vast kettle drum. The water seemed to tremble with it. He guessed its double purpose. It was a great fish call used, when intruders were about, to attract and excite the fish still further. Quarrel had told him how the fishermen at night beat the sides of their canoes with the paddle to wake and bring the fish. This must be the same idea, and at the same time it would be a sinister voodoo warning to the people on shore, made doubly effective when the dead body was washed up on the following day. Another of Mr. Big's refinements, thought Bond. Another spark thrown off by that extraordinary mind. Well, at least he knew where he was now. The drums meant that he had been spotted. What would Strangways and Quarrel think as they heard them? They would just have to sit and sweat it out. Bond had guessed the drums were some sort of trick and he had made them promise not to interfere unless the Sekalor got safely away. That would mean that all Bond's plans had failed. He had told Strangways where the gold was hidden and the ship would have to be intercepted on the high seas. Now the enemy was alerted, but would not know who he was nor that he was still alive. He would have to go on if only to stop Solitaire at all costs from sailing in the doomed ship. Bond looked at his watch. It was half an hour after. Midnight. So far as Bond was concerned, it might have been a week since he started his lonely voyage through the Sea of Dangers. He felt the beretta under his rubber skin and wondered if it was already ruined by the water that had got in through the rent made by the barracuda's teeth. Then, the roar of the drums getting louder every moment, he moved on into the cave, his torch throwing a tiny pinpoint of light ahead of him. He had gone about ten yards when a faint glimmer showed in the water ahead of him. He doused the torch and went cautiously towards it. The sandy floor of the cave started to move upwards and with every yard the light grew brighter. Now he could see dozens of small fish playing around him and ahead the water seemed full of them, attracted into the cave by the light. Grabs peered from the small crevices in the rocks and a baby octopus flattened itself into a phosphorescent star against the ceiling. Then he could make out the end of the cave and a wide shining pool beyond it, the white sandy bottom as bright as day. The throb of the drums was very loud. He stopped in the shadow of the entrance and saw that the surface was only a few inches away and that lights were shining down into the pool. Bond was in a quandary. 
Any further step and he would be in full view of anyone looking at the pool. As he stood, debating with himself, he was horrified to see a thin red cloud of blood spreading beyond the entrance from his shoulder. He had forgotten the wound, but now it began to throb, and when he moved his arm the pain shot through it. There was also the thin stream of bubbles from the cylinders, but he hoped these were just creeping up to burst unnoticed at the lip of the entrance. Even as he drew back a few inches into his hole, his future was settled for him. Above his head there was a single huge splash and two negroes, naked except for the glass masks over their faces, were onto him, long daggers held like lances in their left hands. Before his hand reached the knife at his belt they had seized both his arms and were hauling him to the surface. Hopelessly, helplessly, Bond let himself be manhandled out of the pool onto flat sand. He was pulled to his feet and the zips of his rubber suit were torn open. His helmet was snatched off his head and his holster from his shoulder and suddenly he was standing among the debris of his black skin, like a flayed snake, naked except for his brief swimming trunks. Blood oozed down from the jagged hole in his left shoulder. When his helmet came off Bond was almost deafened by the shattering boom and stutter of the drums. The noise was in him and all around him. The hastening syncopated rhythm galloped and throbbed in his blood. It seemed enough to wake all. Jamaica. Bond grimaced and clenched his senses against the buffeting tempest of noise. Then his guards turned him round and he was faced with a scene so extraordinary that the sound of the drums receded and all his consciousness was focused through his eyes. In the foreground, at a green baize card table, littered with papers, in a folding chair, sat Mr. Big, a pen in his hand, looking incuriously at him. A Mr. Big in a well-cut fawn tropical suit, with a white shirt and black knitted silk tie. His broad chin rested on his left hand and he looked up at Bond as if he had been disturbed in his office by a member of the staff asking for a raise in salary. He looked polite but faintly bored. A few steps away from him, sinister and incongruous, the scarecrow effigy of Baron Samadhi, erect on a rock, gaped at Bond from under its bowler hat. Mr. Big took his hand off his chin, and his great golden eyes looked Bond over from top to toe. Good morning, Mr. James Bond, he said at last, throwing his flat voice against the dying crescendo of the drums. The fly has indeed been a long time coming to the spider, or perhaps I should say, the minnow to the whale. You left a pretty wake of bubbles after the reef. He leant back in his chair and was silent. The drums softly thudded and boomed so it was the fight with the octopus that had betrayed him. Bond's mind automatically registered the fact as his eyes moved on past the man at the table. He was in a rock chamber as big as a church. Half the floor was taken up with the clear white pool from which he had come and which verged into aquamarine and then blew near the black hole of the underwater entrance. Then there was the narrow strip of sand on which he was standing and the rest of the floor was smooth flat rock dotted with a few gray and white stalagmites. Some way behind Mr. Big, steep steps mounted towards a vaulted ceiling from which short limestone stalactites hung down. From their white nipples water dripped intermittently into the pool or on to the points of the young stalagmites that rose towards them from the floor. A dozen bright arc lights were fixed high up on the walls and reflected golden highlights from the naked chests of a group of negroes standing to his left on the stone floor rolling their eyes and watching Bond, their teeth showing in delighted cruel grins. Round their black and pink feet, in a debris of broken timber and rusty iron hoops, mildewed strips of leather and disintegrating canvas, was a blazing sea of gold coin yards, piles, cascades of round golden specie from which the black legs rose as if they had been halted in the middle of a walk through flame. Beside them were piled row upon row of shallow wooden trays. There were some on the floor partly filled with gold coin and at the bottom of the steps a single negro had stopped on his way up and he was holding one of the trays in his hands and it was full of gold coin, four cylindrical rows of it, held out as if for sale between his hands. Further to the left, in a corner of the chamber, two negroes stood by a bellying iron cauldron suspended over three hissing blow lamps, its base glowing red. They held iron skimmers in their hands and these were splashed with gold halfway up the long handles. Beside them was a towering jumble of gold objects, plate, altar pieces, drinking vessels, crosses, and a stack of gold ingots of various sizes. Along the wall near them were ranged rows of metal cooling trays, their segmented surfaces gleaming yellow, and there was an empty tray on the floor near the cauldron and a long gold spattered ladle, its handle bound with cloth. 
Squatting on the floor not far from Mr. Big, a single negro had a knife in one hand and a jeweled goblet in the other. Beside him on a tin plate was a pile of gems that winked dully, red and blue and green, in the glare of the arcs. It was warm and airless in the great rock chamber and yet Bond shivered as his eyes took in the whole splendid scene, the blazing violet-white lights, the shimmering bronze of the sweating bodies, the bright glare of the gold, the rainbow pool of jewels and the milk and aquamarine of the pool. He shivered at the beauty of it all, at this fabulous petrified ballet in the great treasure house of Bloody Morgan. His eyes came back to the square of green bays and the great zombie face and he looked at the face and into the wide yellow eyes with awe, almost with reverence. Stop the drums, said the big man to no one in particular. They had died almost to a whisper, a lisping beat right on the pulse of the blood. One of the negroes took two softly clanging steps amongst the gold coin and bent down. There was a portable phonograph on the floor and a powerful amplifier leant beside it against the rock wall. There was a click and the drums stopped. The negro shut the lid of the machine and went back to his place. Get on with the work, said Mr. Big, and at once all the figures started moving as if a penny had been put in a slot. The cauldron was stirred, the gold was picked up and clicked into the boxes, the man picked busily at his jeweled goblet and the negro with the tray of gold moved on up the stairs. Bond stood and dripped sweat and blood. The big man bent over the lists on his table and wrote one or two figures with his pen. Bond stirred and felt the prick of a dagger over his kidneys. The big man put down his pen and got slowly to his feet. He moved away from the table. Take over, he said to one of Bond's guards and the naked man walked round the table and sat down in Mr. Big's chair and picked up the pen. Bring him up. Mr. Big walked over to the steps in the rock and started to climb them slowly. Bond felt a prick in his side. He stepped out of the debris of his black skin and followed the slowly climbing figure. No one looked up from his work. No one would slacken when Mr. Big was out of sight. No one would put a jewel or a coin in his mouth. Baron Samadhi was left in charge. Only his zombie had gone from the cave. Live and let die. Chapter 21 Good night to you both. They climbed slowly up, past an open door near the ceiling, for about forty feet and then paused on a wide landing in the rock. Here a single negro with an acetylene light beside him was fitting trays full of gold coin into the center of the fish tanks, scores of which were stacked against the wall. As they waited, two negroes came down the steps from the surface, picked up one of the prepared tanks and went back up the steps with it. Bond guessed the tanks were stocked with sand and weed and fish somewhere up above and then passed to the human chain that stretched down the cliff face. Bond noticed that some of the waiting tanks had gold ingots fitted in the center, and others a gravel of jewels, and he revised his estimate of the treasure, quadrupling it to around four million sterling. Mr. Big stood for a few moments with his eyes on the stone floor. His breathing was deep but controlled. Then they went on up. Twenty steps higher there was another landing, smaller and with a door leading off it. The door had a new chain and padlock on it. The door itself was made of plaited iron slats, brown and corroded with rust. Mr. Big paused again and they stood side by side on the small platform of rock. For a moment Bond thought of escape, but, as if reading his mind, the Negro guard crowded him up against the stone wall away from the big man and Bond knew his first duty was to stay alive and get to solitaire and somehow keep her away from the doomed ship where the acid was slowly eating through the copper of the time fuse. From above, a strong draft of cold air was coming down the shaft and Bond felt the sweat drying on him. He put his right hand up to the wound in his shoulder, undeterred by the prick of the guard's dagger in his side. The blood was dry and caked and most of the arm was numb. It ached viciously. Mr. Big spoke. That wind, Mr. Bond, he pointed up the shaft, is known in Jamaica as the Undertaker's Wind. Bond shrugged his right shoulder and saved his breath. Mr. Big turned to the iron door, took a key from his pocket and unlocked it. He went through and Bond and his guard followed. It was a long, narrow passage of a room with rusty shackles low down in the walls at less than yard intervals. At the far end, where a hurricane light hung from the stone roof, there was a motionless figure under a blanket on the floor. There was one more hurricane light over their heads near the door, otherwise nothing but a smell of damp rock, an ancient torture, and death. Solitaire, 
said Mr. Big softly. Bond's heart leapt and he started forward. At once a huge hand grasped him by the arm. Hold it, white man, snapped his guard and twisted his wrist up between his shoulder blades, hefting it higher until. Bond lashed out with his left heel. It hit the other man's shin, and hurt Bond more than the guard. Mr. Big turned round. He had a small gun almost covered by his huge hand. Let him go, he said, quietly. If you want an extra navel, Mr. Bond, you can have one. I have six of them in this gun. Bond brushed past the big man. Solitaire was on her feet, coming towards him. When she saw his face she broke into a run holding out her two hands. James, she sobbed, James. She almost fell at his feet. Their hands clutched at each other. Get me some rope, said Mr. Big in the doorway. It's all right, solitaire, said Bond, knowing that it wasn't. It's all right, I'm here now. He picked her up and held her at arm's length. It hurt his left arm. She was pale and disheveled. There was a bruise on her forehead and black circles under her eyes. Her face was grimy and tears had made streaks down the pale skin. She had no makeup. She wore a dirty white linen suit and sandals. She looked thin. What's the bastard been doing to you? said Bond. He suddenly held her tightly to him. She clung to him, her face buried in his neck. Then she drew away and looked at her hand. But you're bleeding, she said. What is it? She turned him half round and saw the black blood on his shoulder and down his arm. Oh my darling, what is it? She started to cry again, forlornly, hopelessly, realizing suddenly that they were both lost. Tie them up, said the big man from the door. Here under the light, I have things to say to them. The negro came towards them and Bond turned. Was it worth a gamble? The negro had nothing but rope in his hands. But the big man had stepped sideways and was watching him, the gun held loosely, half pointing at the floor. No. Mr. Bond, he said simply. Bond eyed the big negro and thought of solitaire and his own wounded arm. The negro came up and Bond allowed his arms to be tied behind his back. They were good knots. There was no play in them. They hurt. Bond smiled at solitaire. He half closed one eye. It was nothing but bravado, but he saw a hopeful awareness dawn through her tears. The negro led him back to the doorway. There, said the big man pointing at one of the shackles. The negro cut Bond's legs from under him with a sudden sweep of his shin. Bond fell on his wounded shoulder. The negro pulled him by the rope up to the shackle, tested it, and put the rope through and then down to Bond's ankles which he bound securely. He had stuck his dagger in a crevice in the rock. He pulled it out and cut the rope and went back to where Solitaire was standing. Bond was left sitting on the stone floor, his legs straight out in front his arms hoisted up and secured behind him. Blood dripped down from his freshly opened wound. Only the remains of the benzedrine in his system kept him from fainting. Solitaire was bound and placed almost opposite him. There was a yard between their feet. When it was done, the big man looked at his watch. Go, he said to the guard. He closed the iron door behind the man and leant against it. Bond and the girl looked at each other and the big man gazed down on both of them. After one of his long silences he addressed Bond. Bond looked up at him. The great grey football of a head under the hurricane lamp looked like an elemental, a malignant specter from the center of the earth, as it hung in mid-air, the golden eyes blazing steadily, the great body in shadow. Bond had to remind himself that he had heard its heart pumping in its chest, had heard it breathe, had seen sweat on the grey skin. It was only a man, of the same species as himself, a big man, with a brilliant brain but still a man who walked and defecated, a mortal man with a diseased heart. The wide rubbery mouth split open and the flat slightly everted lips drew back from the big white teeth. You are the best of those that have been sent against me, said Mr. Big. His quiet flat voice was thoughtful, measured, and you have achieved the death of four of my assistants. My followers find this incredible. It was fully time that accounts should be squared. What happened to the American was not sufficient. The treachery of this girl, he still looked at Bond, whom I found in the gutter and whom I was prepared to put on my right hand, has also brought my infallibility in question. I was wondering how she should die, when Providence, or Baron Samadhi as my followers will believe, 
brought you also to the altar with your head bowed ready for the axe. The mouth paused, with the lips parted. Bond saw the teeth come together to form the next word. So it is convenient that you should die together. That will happen, in an appropriate fashion, the big man looked at his watch, in two and a half hours time. At six o'clock. Give or take, he added, a few minutes. Let's give those minutes, said Bond. I enjoy my life. In the history of Negro emancipation, Mr. Big continued in an easy conversational tone, there have already appeared great athletes, great musicians, great writers, great doctors and scientists. In due course, as in the developing history of other races, there will appear Negroes great and famous in every other walk of life. He paused. It is unfortunate for you, Mr. Bond, and for this girl, that you have encountered the first of the great Negro criminals. I use a vulgar word, Mr. Bond, because it is the one you, as a form of policeman, would yourself use. But I prefer to regard myself as one who has the ability and the mental and nervous equipment to make his own laws and act according to them rather than accept the laws that suit the lowest common denominator of the people. You have doubtless read Trotter's instincts of the herd in war and peace, Mr. Bond. Well, I am by nature and predilection a wolf and I live by wolf's laws. Naturally the sheep describe such a person as a criminal. The fact, Mr. Bond, the big man continued after a pause, that I survive and indeed enjoy limitless success, although I am alone against countless millions of sheep, is attributable to the modern techniques I described to you on the occasion of our last talk, and to an infinite capacity for taking pains. Not dull, plodding pains, but artistic, subtle pains. And I find, Mr. Bond, that it is not difficult to outwit sheep, however many of them there may be, if one is dedicated to the task and if one is by nature an extremely well-equipped wolf. Let me illustrate to you, by an example, how my mind works. We will take the method I have decided upon by which you are both to die. It is a modern variation on the method used in the time of my kind patron, Sir Henry Morgan. In those days it was known as, keel hauling. Pray continue, said Bond, not looking at solitaire. We have a paravane on board the yacht, continued Mr. Big as if he was a surgeon describing a delicate operation to a body of students, which we use for trawling for shark and other big fish. This paravane, as you know, is a large buoyant torpedo-shaped device, which rides on the end of a cable, away from the side of a ship, and which can be used for sustaining the end of a net, and drawing it through the water when the ship is in motion, or if fitted with a cutting device, for severing the cables of moored mines in time of war. I intend, said Mr. Big, in a matter-of-fact discursive tone of voice, to bind you together to a line stream from this paravane and to tow you through the sea until you are eaten by sharks. He paused, and his eyes looked from one to the other. Solitaire was gazing wide-eyed at Bond and Bond was thinking hard, his eyes blank and his mind boring into the future. He felt he ought to say something. You are a big man, he said, and one day you will die a big, horrible death. If you kill us, that death will come soon. I have arranged for it. You are going mad very fast or you would see what our murder will bring down on you. Even as he spoke Bond's mind was working fast, counting hours and minutes, knowing that the big man's own death was creeping, with the acid in the fuse, round the minute hand towards his personal hour of final rendezvous. But would he and Solitaire be dead before that hour struck? There would not be more than minutes, perhaps seconds in it. The sweat poured off his face onto his chest. He smiled across at Solitaire. She looked back at him opaquely, her eyes not seeing him. Suddenly she gave an agonized cry that made Bond's nerves jerk. I don't know, she cried. I can't see. It's so near, so close. There is much death, but... Solitaire, shouted Bond, terrified that whatever strange things she saw in the future might give a warning to the big man. Pull yourself together. There was an angry bite in his voice. Her eyes cleared, she looked dumbly at him, without comprehension. The big man spoke again. I am not going mad, Mr. Bond, he said evenly, and nothing you have arranged will affect me. You will die beyond the reef and there will be no evidence. I shall tow the remains of your bodies until there is nothing left. That is part of the dexterity of my intentions. You may also know that shark and barracuda play a role in voodooism. They will have their sacrifice and Baron Samadhi will be appeased. That will satisfy my followers. I wish also to continue my experiments with carnivorous fish.
I believe they only attack when there is blood in the water. So your bodies will be towed from the island. The paravane will take them over the reef. I believe you will not be harmed inside the reef. The blood and offal that is thrown into these waters every night will have dispersed or been consumed. But when your bodies have been dragged over the reef, then I'm afraid you will bleed, your bodies will be very raw. And then we will see if my theories are correct. The big man put his hand behind him and pulled the door open. I will leave you now, he said, to reflect on the excellence of the method I have invented for your death together. Two necessary deaths are achieved. No evidence is left behind. Superstition is satisfied. My followers pleased. The bodies are used for scientific research. That is what I meant, Mr. James Bond, by an infinite capacity for taking artistic pains. He stood in the doorway and looked at them. A short, but very good night to you both. Live and let die. Chapter 22. Terror by Sea. IT was not yet light when their guards came for them. Their leg ropes were cut and with their arms still pinioned they were led up the remaining stone stairs to the surface. They stood amongst the sparse trees and Bond sniffed the cool morning air. He gazed through the trees towards the east and saw that there the stars were paler and the horizon luminous with the breaking dawn. The night song of the crickets was almost done and somewhere on the island a mockingbird bubbled its first notes. He guessed that it was either side of half past five. They stood there for several minutes. Negroes brushed past them carrying bundles and jippa jappa holdles, talking in cheerful whispers. The doors of the handful of thatched huts among the trees had been left swinging open. The men filed to the edge of the cliff to the right of where Bond and Solitaire were standing and disappeared over the edge. They didn't come back, it was evacuation, the whole garrison of the island was decamping. Bond rubbed his naked shoulder against Solitaire and she pressed against him. It was cold after the stuffy dungeon and Bond shivered, but it was better to be on the move than for the suspense down below to be prolonged. They both knew what had to be done, the nature of the gamble. When the big man had left them, Bond had wasted no time. In a whisper, he had told the girl of the limpet mine against the side of the ship time to explode a few minutes after six o'clock and he had explained the factors that would decide who would die that morning. First, he gambled on Mr. Big's mania for exactitude and efficiency. The secature must sail on the dot of six o'clock. Then there must be no cloud, or visibility high the half-light of dawn would not be sufficient for the ship to make the passage through the reef and Mr. Big would postpone the sailing. If Bond and Solitaire were on the jetty alongside the ship, they would then be killed with M.I. Big. Supposing the ship sailed dead on time, how far behind and to one side of her would their bodies be towed? It would have to be on the port side for the paravane to clear the island. Bond guessed the cable to the paravane would be 50 yards and that they would be towed 20 or 30 yards behind the paravane. If he was right, they would be hauled over the outer reef about 50 yards after the secature had cleared the passage. She would probably approach the passage at about 3 knots and then put on speed to 10 or even 20. At first their bodies would be swept away from the island in a slow arc, twisting and turning at the end of the tow rope. Then the paravane would straighten out and when the ship had got through the reef, they would still be approaching it. The paravane would then cross the reef when the ship was about 40 yards outside it and they would follow. Bond shuddered to think of the mauling their bodies would suffer being dragged at any speed over the razor-sharp ten yards of coral rocks and trees. The skin on their backs and legs would be flayed off. Once over the reef they would be just a huge bleeding bait and it would be only a matter of minutes before the first shark or barracuda was onto them. And Mr. Big would sit comfortably in the stern sheets, watching the bloody show, perhaps with glasses, and ticking off the seconds and minutes as the living bait got smaller and smaller and finally the fish snapped at the blood-stained rope. Until there was nothing left. Then the paravane would be hoisted inboard and the yacht would plow gracefully on towards the distant. Florida Keys. Cape Sable. And the sun-soaked wharf in. St. Petersburg. Harbor. And if the mine exploded while they were still in the water, only fifty yards away from the ship, what would be the effect of the shock waves on their bodies? It might not be deadly. The hull of the ship should absorb most of it. The reef might protect them. Bond could only guess and hope. Above all they must stay alive to the last possible second. They must keep breathing as they were hauled, a living bundle, through the sea. 
Much depended on how they would be bound together. Mr. Big would want them to stay alive. He would not be interested high dead bait. If they were still alive when the first shark's fin showed on the surface behind them Bond had coldly decided to drown Solitaire. Drown her by twisting her body under his and holding her there. Then he would try and drown himself by twisting her dead body back over his to keep him under. There was nightmare at every turn of his thoughts, sickening horror in every grisly aspect of the monstrous torture and death this man had invented for them. But Bond knew he must remain cold and absolutely resolved to fight for their lives to the end. There was at least warmth in the knowledge that Mr. Big and most of his men would also die. And there was a glimmer of hope that he and Solitaire would survive. Unless the mine failed, there was no such hope for the enemy. All this, and a hundred other details and plans went through Bond's mind in the last hour before they were brought up the shaft to the surface. He shared all his hopes with Solitaire. None of his fears. She had lain opposite him, her tired blue eyes fixed on him, obedient, trusting, drinking in his face and his words, pliant, loving. Don't worry about me, my darling, she had said when the men came for them. I am happy to be with you again. My heart is full of it. For some reason I am not afraid although there is much death very close. Do you love me a little? Yes, said Bond, and we shall have our love. Get up, said one of the men. And now, on the surface, it was getting lighter, and from below the cliff Bond heard the great twin diesel stutter and roar. There was a light flutter of breeze to windward, but to leeward, where the ship lay, the bay was a gunmetal mirror. Mr. Big appeared up the shaft, a businessman's leather brief case in his hand. He stood for a moment looking round, gaining his breath. He paid no attention to Bond and Solitaire nor to the two guards standing beside them with revolvers in their hands. He looked up at the sky, and suddenly called out, in a loud clear voice, towards the rim of the sun. Thank you, Sir Henry Morgan. Your treasure will be well spent. Give us a fair wind. The Negro guards showed the whites of their eyes. The undertaker's wind it is, said Bond. The big man looked at him. All down, he asked the guards. Yassa, boss, answered one of them. Take them along, said the big man. They went to the edge of the cliff and down the steep steps, one guard in front, one behind. Mr. Big followed. The engines of the long graceful yacht were turning over quietly, the exhaust bubbling glutinously, a thread of blue vapor rising astern. There were two men on the jetty at the guide ropes. There were only three men on deck besides the captain and the navigator on the gray streamlined bridge. There was no room for more. All the available deck space, save for a fishing chair rigged right aft, was covered with fish tanks. The red ensign had been struck and only the stars and stripes hung motionless at the stern. A few yards clear of the ship the red torpedo-shaped paravane, about six foot long, lay quietly on the water now aquamarine in the early dawn. It was attached to a thick pile of wire cable, coiled up on the deck aft. To Bond there looked to be a good fifty yards of it. The water was crystal clear and there were no fish about. The undertaker's wind was almost dead. Soon the doctor's wind would start to breathe in from the sea. How soon, wondered Bond, was it an omen? Away beyond the ship he could see the roof of. Bow. Desert. Among the trees, but the jetty and the ship and the cliff path were still in deep shadow. Bond wondered if night glasses would be able to pick them out. And if they could, what Strangways would be thinking? Mr. Big stood on the jetty and supervised the process of binding them together. Strip her, he said to Solitaire's guard. Bond flinched. He stole a glance at Mr. Big's wrist watch. It said ten minutes to six. Bond kept silence. There must not be even a minute's delay. Throw the clothes on board, said Mr. Big. Tie some strips round his shoulder. I don't want any blood in the water, yet. Solitaire's clothes were cut off her with a knife. She stood pale and naked. She hung her head and the heavy black hair fell forward over her face. Bond's shoulder was roughly bound with strips of her linen skirt. You bastard, said Bond through his teeth. Under Mr. Big's direction, their hands were freed. Their bodies were pressed together face to face, and their arms held round each other's waists and then bound tightly again. Bond felt Solitaire's soft breasts pressed against him. She leant her chin on his right shoulder. 
I didn't want it to be like this, she whispered tremulously. Bond didn't answer. He hardly felt her body. He was counting seconds. On the jetty there was a pile of rope to the paravane. It hung down off the jetty and Bond could see it lying along the sand until it rose to meet the belly of the red torpedo. The free end was tied under their armpits and knotted tightly between them in the space between their necks. It was all very carefully done. There was no possible escape. Bond was counting the seconds. He made it five minutes to six. Mr. Big had a last look at them. Their legs can stay free, he said. They'll make appetizing bait. He stepped off the jetty on to the deck of the yacht. The two guards went aboard. The two men on the jetty unhitched their lines and followed. The screws churned up the still water and with the engines at half speed ahead the secature slid swiftly away from the island. Mr. Big went aft and sat down in the fishing chair. They could see his eyes fixed on them. He said nothing, made no gesture. He just watched. The secature cut through the water towards the reef. Bond could see the cable to the paravane snaking over the side. The paravane started to move softly after the ship. Suddenly it put its nose down, then righted itself and sped away, its rudder pulling out and away from the wake of the ship. The coil of rope beside them leapt into life. Look out, said Bond urgently, holding tighter to the girl. Their arms were pulled almost out of their sockets as they were jerked together off the jetty into the sea. For a second they both went under. Then they were on the surface, their joined bodies smashing through the water. Bond gasped for breath amongst the waves and spray that dashed past his twisted mouth. He could hear the rasping of Solitaire's breath next to his ear. Breathe, breathe, he shouted through the rushing of the water. Lock your legs against mine. She heard him and he felt her knees pressing between his thighs. She had a paroxysm of coughing. Then her breath became more even against his ear and the thumping of her heart eased against his breast. At the same time their speed slackened. Hold your breath, shouted Bond. I've got to have a look. Ready. A pressure of her arms answered him. He felt her chest heave as she filled her lungs. With the weight of his body he swung her round so that his head was now quite out of water. They were plowing along at about three knots. He twisted his head above the small bow wave they were throwing up. The secature was entering the passage through the reef, about 80 yards away, he guessed. The paravane was skimming slowly along almost at right angles to her. Another 30 yards and the red torpedo would be crossing the broken water over the reef. A further 30 yards behind, they were riding slowly across the surface of the bay. 60 yards to go to the reef. Bond twisted his body and solitaire came up, gasping. Still they moved slowly along through the water. 5 yards, 10, 15, 20. Only 40 yards to go before they hit the coral. The secature would be just through. Bond gathered his breath. It must be past 6 now. What had happened to the blasted mine? Bond thought a quick fervent prayer. God save us, he said into the water. Suddenly he felt the rope tighten under his arms. Breathe, solitaire, breathe, he shouted as they got underway and the water started to hiss past them. Now they were flying over the sea towards the crouching reef. There was a slight check. Bond guessed that the paravane had fouled a niggerhead or a piece of surface coral. Then their bodies hurtled on again in their deadly embrace. Thirty yards to go, twenty, ten. Jesus Christ, thought Bond, were for it. He braced his muscles to take the crashing, searing pain, edged solitaire further above him to protect her from the worst of it. Suddenly the breath whistled out of his body and a giant fist thumped him into solitaire so that she rose right out of the sea above him and then fell back. A split second later lightning flashed across the sky and there was the thunder of an explosion. They stopped dead in the water and Bond felt the weight of the slack rope pulling them under. His legs sank down beneath his stunned body and water rushed into his mouth. It was this that brought him back to consciousness. His legs pounded under him and brought their mouths to the surface. The girl was a dead weight in his arms. He trod water desperately and looked round him, holding Solitaire's lolling head on his shoulder above the surface. The first thing he saw was the swirling waters of the reef not five yards away. Without its protection they would both have been crushed by the shock wave of the explosion. He felt the tug and eddy of its currents round his legs. He backed desperately towards it, catching gulps of air when he could. 
His chest was bursting with the strain and he saw the sky through a red film. The rope dragged him down and the girl's hair filled his mouth and tried to choke him. Suddenly he felt the sharp scrape of the coral against the back of his legs. He kicked and felt frantically with his feet for a foothold, flaying the skin off with every movement. He hardly felt the pain. Now his back was being scraped in his arms. He floundered clumsily, his lungs burning in his chest. Then there was a bed of needles under his feet. He put all his weight on it, leaning back against the strong eddies that tried to dislodge him. His feet held and there was rock at his back. He leant back panting, blood streaming up around him in the water, holding the girl's cold, scarcely breathing body against him. For a minute he rested, blessedly, his eyes shut and the blood pounding through his limbs, coughing painfully, waiting for his senses to focus again. His first thought was for the blood in the water around him. But he guessed the big fish would not venture into the reef. Anyway there was nothing he could do about it. Then he looked out to sea. There was no sign of the secature. High up in the still sky there was a mushroom of smoke, beginning to trail, with the doctor's wind, in towards the land. There were things strewn all over the water and a few heads bobbing up and down and the whole sea was glinting with the white stomachs of fish stunned or killed by the explosion. There was a strong smell of explosive in the air. On the fringe of the debris, the red paravane lay quietly, hull down, anchored by the cable whose other end must lie somewhere on the bottom. Fountains of bubbles were erupting on the glassy surface of the sea. On the edge of the circle of bobbing heads and dead fish a few triangular fins were cutting fast through the water. More appeared as Bond watched. Once he saw a great snout come out of the water and smash down on something. The fins threw up spray as they flashed among the tidbits. Two black arms suddenly stuck up in the air and then disappeared. There were screams. Two or three pairs of arms started to flail the water towards the reef. One man stopped to bang the water in front of him with the flat of his hand. Then his hands disappeared under the surface. Then he too began to scream and his body jerked to and fro in the water. Barracuda hitting into him, said Bond's dazed mind. But one of the heads was getting nearer, making for the bit of reef where Bond stood, the small waves breaking under his armpits, the girl's black hair hanging down his back. It was a large head and a veil of blood streamed down over the face from a wound in the great bald skull. Bond watched it come on. The big man was executing a blundering breast stroke, making enough flurry in the water to attract any fish that wasn't already occupied. Bond wondered whether he would make it. Bond's eyes narrowed and his breath became calmer as he watched the cruel sea for its decision. The surging head came nearer. Bond could see the teeth showing in a rictus of agony and frenzied endeavor. Blood half veiled the eyes that Bond knew would be bulging in their sockets. He could almost hear the great diseased heart thumping under the gray-black skin. Would it give out before the bait was taken? The big man came on. His shoulders were naked, his clothes stripped off him by the explosion, Bond supposed, but the black silk tie had remained and it showed round the thick neck and streamed behind the head like a Chinaman's pigtail. A splash of water cleared some blood away from the eyes. They were wide open, staring madly towards Bond. They held no appeal for help, only a fixed glare of physical exertion. Even as Bond looked into them, now only ten yards away, they suddenly shut and the carrot great face contorted in a grimace of pain. Air, said the distorted mouth. Both arms stopped flailing the water and the head went under and came up again. A cloud of blood welled up and darkened the sea. Two six-foot-thin brown shadows backed out of the cloud and then dashed back into it. The body in the water jerked sideways. Half of the big man's left arm came out of the water. It had no hand, no wrist, no wrist watch. But the great turnip head, the drawn back mouth full of white teeth almost splitting it in half, was still alive. And now it was screaming, a long gurgling scream that only broke each time a barracuda hit into the dangling body. There was a distant shout from the bay behind Bond. He paid no attention. All his senses were focused on the horror in the water in front of him. A fin split the surface a few yards away and stopped. Bond could feel the shark pointing like a dog, the short-sighted pink button eyes trying low pierce the cloud of blood and weigh up the prey. Then it shot in towards the chest and the screaming head went under as sharply as a fisherman's float. Some bubbles burst on the surface. 
There was the swirl of a sharp brown spotted tail as the huge leopard shark backed out to swallow and attack again. The head floated back to the surface. The mouth was closed. The yellow eyes seemed still to look at Bond. Then the shark's snout came right out of the water and it drove in towards the head, the lower curved jaw opened so that light glinted on the teeth. There was a horrible grunting scrunch and a great swirl of water. Then silence. Bond's dilated eyes went on staring at the brown stain that spread wider and wider across the sea. Then the girl moaned and Bond came to his senses. There was another shout from behind him and he turned his head towards the bay. It was Quarrel, his brown gleaming chest towering above the slim hull of a canoe, his arms flailing at the paddle, and a long way behind him all the other canoes of Shark Bay skimming like water boatmen across the small waves that had started to ripple the surface. The fresh northeast trade winds had started to blow and the sun was shining down on the blue water and on the soft green flanks of Jamaica. The first tears since his childhood came into James Bond's blue-gray eyes and ran down his drawn cheeks into the bloodstained sea. Live and Let Die. Chapter 23. Passionate Leave. Like dangling emerald pendants the two humming birds were making their last rounds of the hibiscus and a mocking bird had started on its evening song sweeter than a nightingale's, from the summit of a bush of night-scented jasmine. The jagged shadow of a man-of-war bird floated across the green Bahama grass of the lawn as it sailed on the air currents up the coast to some distant colony, and a slate-blue kingfisher chattered angrily as it saw the man sitting in the chair in the garden. It changed its flight and swerved off across the sea to the island. A brimstone butterfly flirted among the purple shadows under the palms. The graded blue waters of the bay were quite still. The cliffs of the island were a deep rose in the light of the setting sun behind the house. There was a smell of evening and of coolness after a hot day and a slight scent of peat smoke that came from cassava being roasted in one of the fishermen's huts in the village away to the right. Solitaire came out of the house and walked on naked feet across the lawn. She was carrying a tray with a cocktail shaker and two glasses. She put it down on a bamboo table beside Bond's chair. I hope I've made it right, she said. Six to one sounds terribly strong. I've never had vodka martinis before. Bond looked up at her. She was wearing a pair of his white silk pajamas. They were far too large for her. She looked absurdly childish. She laughed. How do you like my Port Maria lipstick? She asked, and the eyebrows made up with an HB pencil. I couldn't do anything with the rest of me except wash it. You look wonderful, said Bond. You're far the prettiest girl in the whole of shark bay if i had some legs and arms i'd get up and kiss you solitaire bent down and kissed him long on the lips one arm tightly round his neck she stood up and smoothed back the comma of black hair that had fallen down over his forehead they looked at each other for a moment then she turned to the table and poured him out a cocktail she poured half a glass for herself and sat down on the warm grass and put her head against his knee he played with her hair with his right hand and they sat for a while looking out between the trunks of the palm trees at the sea and the light fading on the island. The day had been given over to licking wounds and cleaning up the remains of the mess. When Quarrel had landed them on the little beach at Bow Desert, Bond had half carried solitaire across the lawn and into the bathroom. He had filled the bath full of warm water. Without her knowing what was happening he had soaked and washed her whole body and her hair. When he had cleaned away all the salt and coral slime he helped her out, dried her and put mertheolet on the coral cuts that striped her back and thighs. Then he gave her a sleeping draft and put her naked between the sheets in his own bed. He kissed her. Before he had finished closing the jalousies she was asleep. Then he got into the bath and strangways soaked him down and almost bathed his body in mertheolet. He was raw and bleeding in a hundred places and his left arm was numb from the barracuda bite. He had lost a mouthful of muscle at the shoulder. The sting of the mertheolet made him grind his teeth. He put on a dressing gown and Quarrel drove him to the hospital at Port Maria. Before he left he had a Lucullian breakfast and a blessed first cigarette. He fell asleep in the car and he slept on the operating table and in the cot where they finally put him, a mass of bandages and surgical tape. Quarrel brought him back in the early afternoon. By that time Strangways had acted on the information Bond had given him. There was a police detachment on the Isle of Surprise, the wreck of the Secature, 
lying in about 20 fathoms, was buoyed in the position being patrolled by the customs launch from Port Maria. The salvage tug and divers were on their way from Kingston. Reporters from the local press had been given a brief statement and there was a police guard on the entrance to Bow Desert, prepared to repel the flood of newspapermen who would arrive in Jamaica. When the full story got out to the world, meanwhile a detailed report had gone to M and to Washington, so that the big man's team in Harlem and St. Petersburg could be rounded up and provisionally held on a blanket gold smuggling charge. There were no survivors from the secature, but the local fishermen had brought in nearly a ton of dead fish that morning. Jamaica was aflame with rumors. There were serried ranks of cars on the cliffs above the bay and along the beach below. Word had got out about Bloody Morgan's treasure, but also about the packs of shark and barracuda that had defended it and because of them there was not a swimmer who was planning to get out to the scene of the wreck under cover of darkness. A doctor had been to visit Solitaire but had found her chiefly concerned about getting some clothes and the right shade of lipstick. Strangways had arranged for a selection to be sent over from Kingston. Next day, for the time being she was experimenting with the contents of Bond's suitcase and a bowl of hibiscus. Strangways got back from Kingston. Shortly after Bond's return from hospital, he had a signal for Bond from M. It read, Presume you have filed claim to treasure in your name behalf Universal Export Stop Proceed immediately with salvage stop have engaged counsel to press our rights with Treasury and Colonial Office Stop Meanwhile very well done stop Fortnite's passionate leave granted end it. I suppose he means, compassionate, said Bond. Strangways looked solemn, I expect so, he said. I made a full report of the damage to you, and to the girl, he added. Hum, said Bond, M's cypherines don't often pick a wrong group. However, Strangways looked carefully out of the window with his one eye. It's so like the old devil to think of the gold first, said Bond. Suppose he thinks he can get away with it and somehow dodge a reduction in the secret fund when the next parliamentary estimates come round. I expect half his life is taken up with arguing with the treasury but still he's been pretty quick off the mark. I filed your claim at Government House directly I got the signal, said Strangways. But it's going to be tricky. The crown will be after it and America will come in somewhere as he was an American citizen. It'll be a long business. They had talked some more and then Strangways had left and Bond had walked painfully out into the garden to sit for a while in the sunshine with his thoughts. In his mind he ran once more the gauntlet of dangers he had entered on his long chase after the big man and the fabulous treasure, and he lived again through the searing flashes of time when he had looked various deaths in the face. And now it was over and he sat in the sunshine among the flowers with the prize at his feet and his hand in her long black hair. He clasped the moment to him and thought of the fourteen tomorrows that would be theirs between them. There was a crash of broken crockery from the kitchen at the back of the house and the sound of Quarrel's voice thundering at someone. Poor Quarrel, said Solitaire. He's borrowed the best cook in the village and ransacked the markets for surprises for us. He's even found some black crabs, the first of the season. Then he's roasting a pitiful little sucking pig and making an avocado pear salad and we're to finish up with guavas and coconut cream. And Commander Strangways has left a case of the best champagne in. Jamaica. My mouth's watering already, but don't forget it's supposed to be a secret. I wandered into the kitchen and found he had almost reduced the cook to tears. He's coming with us on our passionate holiday, said Bond. He told her of M's cable. We're going to a house on stilts with palm trees and five miles of golden sand. And you'll have to look after me very well because I shan't be able to make love with only one arm. There was open sensuality in Solitaire's eyes as she looked up at him. She smiled innocently. What about my back? She said. 1. This terrifying gambling case is described in the author's Casino Royale. 2. This, one of the great travel books, is published by John Murray at 253.